In less than a week now, one of my most anticipated games of the year releases, and that of course is the game on the screen right now, Ghost of Tsushima. After recent disappointment, I'm just ready to sink a ton of hours into a massive, gorgeous open world experience that hopefully delivers on both story and gameplay. Thus far, I've only heard good things and I'm genuinely excited to play and hopefully review this title, but for now, we have quite a bit of gaming news to discuss and break down. Of course, we have the main subjects in the title in which Activision Blizzard is facing a new wave of heat, The Last of Us 2 review madness continues to unravel, and Bethesda recently thanked Bioware for their major anthem fail, which kind of saved them, but there's also a variety of other small news stories I quickly want to tackle because, I mean, a lot of it's been happening in this AAA games industry in recent days. Like, 2K Games has begun the greedy campaign to up newly released video games from $60 to $70, which I don't find this idea as completely wrong as development costs continue to skyrocket, but this industry, especially 2K Games, has endorsed and practically shoved literal online casinos into fully priced games. These corporations are making billions, and I'm certain many may be willing to spend some extra money on innovative games like, say, Cyberpunk 2077 or God of War, but on the other hand, trashy reskins of NBA 2K, Madden, or FIFA? Yeah, that ain't happening. Speaking of online casinos, in the United Kingdom, it was recently announced the House of Lords Gambling Committee says video game loot boxes should be regulated under gambling laws. If a product looks like gambling and feels like gambling, it should be regulated as gambling. Which, this is great that the UK finally realized that loot boxes are glorified slot machines, so basically gambling, but we'll see what happens. This industry will fight back with lobbyists and lots of money as they usually do, but stories like this are not going away, which might indicate serious force change is about to hit this industry no matter what in one of the biggest markets in the world. For what it's worth, Electronic Arts did in fact respond to this report Again, claiming loot boxes are not gambling, blah 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 blah. FIFA Ultimate Team can be played without spending any money, and purchases are entirely optional. Basically, the typical nonsensical quote-unquote excuse, which is factually false as everyone knows, you enjoy endless grind or you pay up. Exploitation and manipulation at its best. But to another story, I found this just a little bit funny because it really just shows how much 2K Games truly cares about their sports franchises, and that's the fact that their new W. WWE 2K Battlegrounds official trailer literally features a mouse cursor in one shot, which, yeah, clear mistake, but not really sure how that gets approved by, I assume, multiple people, unless one person just threw some crappy little clips together and didn't bother reviewing the official trailer. Laziness or incompetency or a mistake, you decide. In other news, Amazon's crappy multiplayer shooter Crucible, which nobody cared for, is actually unreleasing, going back to beta because it bombed at launch so badly. Can a game actually Actually unreleased, not even sure, but great first impressions for Amazon as a developer in this AAA games industry. Delivering something just as lackluster as Fallout 76 and Anthem, but instead of outrage, Amazon's met to silence, which probably is even worse. Last but not least, Atari is dropping a $400 retro modern console right around the time the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X launch, for some reason, with also very little of anything like games and developer backing because Atari just wants to experience some epic failure in a year which will be defined by just that. But anyway, as usual, before we proceed forward, if you do go on to enjoy this content and want to show your support for videos like this, please consider hitting that like button, subscribing for more, and turning notifications on so you do not miss out on any new content. Also, if you don't already know, I am on Patreon if you want to help out the channel further with financial support and gain some benefits like deciding certain upcoming content, become a patron today. As always, links are down in the description below. Nonetheless, we're actually a few weeks past the launch of The Last of Us part two, and conversation or outrage surrounding this title just continues to roar on. Without a doubt, one of the most controversial releases in years, and things as of late have gotten ugly, with Laura Bailey, who portrays Abby in The Last of Us Part Two, and Naughty Dog game director Neil Druckmann sharing disgusting messages that they have received from angry morons in recent weeks, which includes actual threats aimed at their families and themselves. It's really just quite horrifying what all of this outrage has evolved into, and as everyone has been saying, this is definitely the last Jedi all over again. I myself am not someone who hates this game. If you have not seen my review of the game, I highly recommend that you check it out as I touch on the sequel's crazy development, reception, and of course my actual opinion on the game, which includes me praising various aspects of the overall experience while also being a bit critical towards the narrative. And that's where all the anchor comes from, narrative decisions that many disagree with, and some well off 
obviously based on the horrifying messages sent to Naughty Dog, you already know some really, really, really hate it. On Metacritic, there's been a literal war going on between users, with originally The Last of Us Part 2 being review bombed down to a 4.3, maybe lower, but in recent weeks, many newer user review scores have countered that, bringing it up to a 5.4. And actually, there's now more positive than negative review scores with over 120,000 scores submitted, which is just insane. Insane enough to actually cause Metacritic to reevaluate their system, as it appears they've implemented one notable change, not allowing user scores to be submitted until a few days after launch, which is something but probably won't change much. The only way Metacritic stops review bombings or fake reviews with a crap load of 10 out of 10s and 0 out of 10s coming from many who probably haven't even played said game is to incorporate some sort of PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo account integration tool which tracks progress and verifies if someone who is submitting a review has actually played a game like The Last of Us Part 2. So something like Steam System, although I'm guessing that Metacritic probably loves this review bombing campaign and stuff like this because lots of clicks coming to their website, which means lots of revenue. Regardless, sales-wise, for The Last of Us Part 2 at launch, the sequel broke records for PlayStation, but it has somewhat slowed down in recent weeks based on retail sales numbers coming from the UK and Japan. Will this sequel be able to eventually reach the heights of the first game's success of over 17 million copies sold? I would say right now probably not, especially with how divisive reactions have been, but only time will tell. Now, I mentioned this in my review of the game, but conversation surrounding this game has just reached a point of exhaustion. Austin, many gaming outlets have concocted a narrative that anyone who hates this game hates it because of Abby's muscles and or the progressive themes present. We have outlets actually spending time to make fake reviews mocking the very few that actually hate it for those reasons. But then we have, of course, the accusations of paid reviews, which also I don't believe is happening. But I will say that Naughty Dog and Sony really are doing a phenomenal job of feeding this conspiracy theory. This brings us to this great piece coming from Polygon, which examines the mind field that The Last of Us Part 2 has become. Specifically though, at one point this very interesting detail is shared. While the vast majority of reviews have lavished The Last of Us Part 2 with all sorts of praise, a handful of outlets, Polygon included, have been slightly more critical of the blockbuster game. According to Rob Zaxney, who might I add, had a very negative review of the game for Vice, while well, it actually prompted a Sony representative to reach out on behalf of Naughty Dog. They felt some of the conclusions I reached in my review were unfair and dismissed some meaningful changes or improvements. Zaxney, or Zaxney, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, we'll just call him Rob. Rob clarified, the exchange was not confrontational, but it was nonetheless unusual, as the site doesn't typically have big publishers asking in an official capacity why a review reads the way it does. Such things can happen, of course, though often with smaller developers or from publishers who have spotted a factual error in a piece that they want corrected. I was happy to unpack a bit of my reasoning, however, and received a perfectly cordial message in response, Rob says. Naughty Dog's PR team declined to comment on Polygon's inquiry about its exchange with Vice. I said this on Twitter, but what is Naughty Dog doing? What are they thinking? This is just a bizarre decision to reach out and call out opinions shared on the game in a review, calling it unfair, but as I said before, Naughty Dog again did a great job at fueling conspiracies that reviewers were paid off. Anyway, another review for The Last of Us Part 2 which came days ago was from Angry Joe, which was very, very critical of the experience. Joe awarded the game a 6 out of 10, and many of the points Joe made in his review are actually ones that I shared myself. But here's the thing. In the video review, Joe made comedic jokes or skits, as he always does, and as you might expect, some were not too happy with said jokes, including one GameSpot journalist who decided to attack Angry Joe after Angry Joe had made a tweet condemning the horrendous messages sent to Abby actor Laura Bailey. The GameSpot journalist replying saying, This tweet from Angry Joe rings incredibly hollow considering his review of The Last of Us Part 2 is just an extended diatribe of his sexist, misogynistic views. His content more than likely contributed to people harassing Laura so he can screw off with this pathetic about face. Angry Joe would hit back explaining that the only way this journalist could have came to such a bizarre conclusion is if they didn't even bother to watch his review and instead just want to believe he's this evil person. This GameSpot journalist would hit back saying, I'm not going to give you a full breakdown of why your constant bro talk, microaggressions, and cheap gags at the expense of others is gross. Full disclosure, I actually liked your work back in the day, but to see you sell out for the GG slash anti-SJW crowd was pretty lame, my dude. Furthermore, on the Reset Era Gaming Forums, which features many games journalists and developers who act 
actively post on the forum, they have banned Angry Joe and will no longer allow his content to be showed on the website, which as most of you know by now, Reset Era has a certain reputation of blowing things out of proportions and fueling misguided hate campaigns. The things that they say that they're against. But anyway, seeing Angry Joe being banned is not very surprising as other YouTubers like SkillUp and maybe even myself have been banned. But I think I'll end this topic with the last paragraph of Patricia Hernandez's great Polygon piece, which I mentioned just a bit ago because it sums up my thoughts perfectly. Based on my own conversations with fellow critics, many have assumed an air of wariness about The Last of Us Part II discourse. It feels as if there are all these larger forces working towards maintaining the status quo when it comes to big budget games. It's not enough that the game is selling well or that most of the reviews are positive. You can't fall out of line with the general consensus, even as a joke, without having to worry about whether or not a publisher will be looking over your shoulder or if hundreds of fans will blow up your social media. It is not an environment that is conducive to encouraging honest reviews or critical discussion, which is ultimately a disservice to the game itself. Completely agree with that. Next though, we move to Electronic Arts, who as I mentioned at the start of the video are as usual denying their slot machines aren't really slot machines, but also they have been responding to backlash related to their Madden franchise, vowing to do better, which these companies are really good with their PR speak because these sports franchises barely have evolved in the past 10 years, and that's largely because publishers like Electronic Arts have become complacent. They could deliver something truly groundbreaking, but instead they focus on the next monetization scheme and adding one minor graphical upgrade for their yearly cash cow. Anyway, EA's executives have also enjoyed some backlash from the exact people they do not want to upset, and that would be shareholders. Specifically, the CTW Investment Group, which made complaints against Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick last month, are now making complaints aimed at EA CFO Blake Jorgensen and CTO Kenneth Moss, who received massive pay bonuses while employees were being laid off. As PC Gamer reports, the letter says that in June 2017, Jorgensen and Moss were given special equity awards on top of their standard compensation. And interesting that timing because only a few months later, you know, Visceral Games, the longtime developer of the Dead Space franchise, they were they were gone. And there's also a bunch of other studios that went under. Jorgensen received a 10 million special equity grant along with his standard 6.5 million annual grant, while Moss got a 7 million dollar grant on top of his 5.5 million annual grant. Equity compensation, as Investopedia explains, is a type of non-cash payment, typically in the form of shares or stock options, that companies will sometimes use to encourage executives to stick around. The problem now is that in November 2019, just two years down the road, Jorgensen was given another $7.5 million on top of his annual $7.5 million grant. While Moss received an extra $5.5 million grant, the CTW Investment Group noted that these equity awards were granted before the performance period for the previous special awards had finished, and said that it raises suspicions that EA is using them to make up for lost income elsewhere, which undermines the spirit of pay for performance. Electronic Arts has loaded up its top executives, including two executives, with two special awards each, while its workers faced massive layoffs last year. This is an undue focus on the short term that cannot be good for the long-term success of EA. And this article from PC Gamer would continue noting the group's success and that they're actually causing some serious, I guess you could say, some trouble for these companies. Not necessarily just Electronic Arts, but also Activision Blizzard. The group is urging shareholders to vote against the say on pay proposal at EA's annual stockholders meeting in August, much as it did with Activision shareholders in June. And while that Activision campaign was not successful, it did get noticed. CTW said in a June press release that more than 43% of Activision Blizzard shareholders voted against the company's say on pay policy, the highest level of opposition the video game giant has received in its history of having votes on CEO pay on its ballot. Not a good look for Electronic Arts, but then again, this company always finds a way to create some controversy, and also their executives, you know, when they're making top dollar and they start firing hundreds and hundreds of employees, and they're also reporting every single year they're making billions of dollars off of FIFA Ultimate Team and Madden Ultimate Team, and in addition to that, they're raking in tons of dollars from sales alone, because Madden and FIFA are among the top sellers every single year. 
sadly. Now, I will point out that when Electronic Arts puts out statements talking about layoffs and trying to hit to the heart, saying it's a difficult decision like they did last year, in which EA CEO Android Wilson pointed out that they had to fire all of these people because it was necessary to address our challenges. And he pointed out in his statement, these are important but very hard decisions, and we do not take them lightly. We are friends and colleagues at EA. We appreciate and value everyone's contributions. And the truth of the matter is that if these EA executives truly cared about the contribution of their employees and developers, they wouldn't be firing them. They would be taking pay cuts because of the tough period, which is largely their fault. We saw this a couple of years ago with the Nintendo CEO, and he set the prime example. He actually took a giant pay cut, and he admitted their faults, and he said he didn't want to fire anyone. But you won't see that from a company like Electronic Arts or Activision Blizzard. Now, in some other Electronic Arts related news, we have Bioware. You remember Bioware? Yeah, they've, uh, they're on the down, downward spiral right now. They've had a rough couple of game releases from Mass Effect Andromeda to Anthem, and we're still waiting on Anthem 2.0. Still no announcement on that. I made a prediction earlier this year that we would see something probably next year. I just don't think we're going to see it this year. But I was kind of surprised that we didn't see any, like, teaser footage or something at EA Play just, I believe, last or earlier last month. It was very, very surprising. Anthem was a game that had some good elements to it, but it just... It was very underwhelming. Now, the interesting thing is, when the game released, it received a lot of, let's just say, a controversial period of time, in which there was a lot of problems with Anthem, and a lot of sketchy things going on with Bioware, in which developers and executives were not being very truthful about the experience. And a lot of the attention that was on Bethesda's Fallout 76, which was going through its own tough patch, which just seemed like every single week there was just something new with Fallout 76 that was controversial, and it was just insane that Bethesda allowed it to happen. But anyway, once Anthem came around and it released, it took some of the heat away from Fallout 76 for at least a period of time. And Bethesda's VP of Marketing, Pete Hines, actually discussed this in a recent podcast from US Gamer, and I want to play his thoughts right here now. EA is trying to rework Anthem, right? Another game that had mm -hmm. a, a you know poor reception. And to, to, tr to go back into work every day and... Um, try to, you know, quote unquote, fix that game or, or rework it or whatever, uh, just must be so challenging, not just the work, but, you know, the morale. Yeah, in the face of all that, it, it absolutely is. I, I remember hearing some stuff from the Anthem folks. It was like, we took a good kicking for at least six months, right? Yeah. And then Anthem came out and then everybody sort of took a break from kicking us <laughs> to dump all over Anthem. Um, and we were like, phew. <laughs> like, <laughs> they got, I mean, I, again, no folks at Bioware, love those folks, but never wish that on anyone, but like they did all take a break from, from kicking us around to go dump on somebody else for for a while. So this conversation would continue a little bit further as Pete Hines would say that from his conversations with some of the people on the Anthem team, they said that they were hoping to turn things around like Fallout 76 somewhat has. Especially when Nuclear Winter released last year, in which yeah, there was some draw to the game for a period of time. Now, the thing is about this statement, I mean, the reason why people jumped on Anthem just as they did with Fallout 76 is because they were underwhelming turds that were sold for $60, and that's just kind of... I mean, there's nothing really else to it. There's just a lot of controversy, a lot of lies coming from the developer, everything that we kind of saw with Fallout 76, and it was really back-to-back, -back. and yes, all the attention went on the new thing, which was Anthem for a period of time, but here we are now, and Anthem's trying to turn things around, although the fact that EA and Bioware haven't been very communicative about the plans, it's very surprising. I really don't know how an Anthem 2.0 can even work at this point. The game's just dead, and I just don't even know if, even if they revamp the experience, I don't know if people are even going to be interested in returning. Does Electronic Arts and Bioware go free to play with Anthem, or do they sell like an expansion style sequel, I guess? Anthem 2.0? It really is difficult to see any of this working out, but I guess only time will tell. Now, next we move to the last main topic of this video, and that is Activision Blizzard. Just a lot of craziness once again with this company. But first, we need to specifically concentrate on Blizzard, because there was something very sketchy that happened about a week ago that I want to give my thoughts on. And it was this story, which is coming from Screen Rant. Blizzard denies allegedly blacklisting Hearthstone player for absurd reason. Blizzard has denied claims that it blacklisted a professional Hearthstone player after his wife publicly criticized the company on social media. Whenever you see Activision Blizzard or any of these companies trying to, I guess the word is 
trying to be woke and trying to act like they truly care about an inclusive future diversity these executives don't care they're just trying to score some good pr like i'm sure developers and people in that company do care but since mike morhaime left and activision took total control over blizzard this is just not the same company the values that they have are kind of meaningless now because activision doesn't believe in them this is a company run on greed and they also just throw employees away like they don't they don't care, that's the best way to put it. Mike Morhaime, under his leadership, this was a different company, but fortunately, this just isn't the same Blizzard. I'll go more in depth in a future video on this, but for now, let's get to this specific story about what's happening again with another Hearthstone player. Because the person, his wife, that publicly criticized the company in social media, she actually was an employee at Blizzard working on Hearthstone. She was a community team member, and she was one of the 800 employees fired last year by Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Cody. And to give some context on what specifically happened and her criticism of the company, this is an interaction that happened, and this is what Screen Rant writes. Around the time of those layoffs, Blizzard community manager Chris Attalus was happily posting about another job posting, not one of the 800 layoffs, amidst controversy about work conditions at Blizzard and how the company handled the layoffs, and Christina McConan, again a former employee now, responded with the below, leading to her being blocked by Attalus. Now this continues, this is actually her tweets, this is what she she recalled from the situation, and a call with the said CM, who has me blocked on Twitter, the CM stated to her husband, who's the Hearthstone player, that I would not be welcome at any Hearthstone event, it would not be able to accompany him in case he was invited to anything in the future. Punishing me is one thing, they don't like me speaking out against what I believe is wrong. Punishing my husband just to punish me is grossly unprofessional, and I, I completely agree with that. But this is just the Activision Blizzard true way of going about things, good old retaliation, because that's exactly what this is. So to give some further support to what's actually happening here, Rod Bleslow, which is kind of like the esports guy, has a lot of sources, he said according to a source, Blizzard and this Hearthstone player, I think his name's Jan McConan, last December they told him Blizzard to not share information with his wife because she was a liability for criticizing Blizzard, which the husband declined, and then he has since not been invited to Hearthstone esports events because of that. Now interestingly, Blizzard did respond to this story because again this is just more bad PR and this year again has just not been very good for Blizzard if you remember the whole Warcraft 3 Reforged situation that erupted at the start of this year although 2020 has been so long with so much crap that feels like that was an eternity ago. To Blizzard's statement, they said Jan McConan, or Savage, which is his Twitter and username, he was not excluded from yesterday's Battlegrounds Brawl event due to his relationship or any type of blacklist. We didn't consider him for it due to a discussion where he did not agree to our request for confidentiality. Now, the interesting thing about that specific response is Jan's actual follow-up. He said that, I got an apology from the community lead. I am now okay to participate in future events and my wife is okay to visit future live events as a guest which seems like blizzard just confirmed that everything that this specific individual had alleged was true but anyway he continues he said i had no idea this would blow up the way it did thanks to everyone who sort of came to my aid and then he said that they stated that i was refusing to sign a normal event nda and that was the reason i was not being considered for events this was not the case no nda was ever brought up in conversations like i said the only way you actually get these companies to respond and do the right thing is by blowing it up in their face as some bad PR, kind of having to expose them, and I'm glad that they did because yet again, Activision Blizzard is showing their true colors here. But let's move to the next story because this one's a little bit more interesting and bigger, and this one's revolving around the Destiny 2 Bungie and Activision relationship because we got a lot of details which actually came just days ago from the Halo composer Marty O'Donnell who opened up about the whole deal and the process and just some very sketchy business that was going on. One thing that I've pointed out in the past is that I never believed that this relationship between Bungie and Activision was just like a mutual it's time to separate. There was some serious issues and Bungie obviously trying to save some face and they don't want to ruin that relationship because you never know. This is an independent company. And maybe they have to reconnect with Activision in the future but things were not working out with Destiny and I would say that this franchise is doing a lot better because of that. One of the things that we do know for sure is the fact that Activision and Bungie had a disagreement with how Destiny was going to be 
handled. Obviously, it seems like Bungie wanted this really truthfully a 10 year journey just with one specific game and improving on it as a live service, but Activision, you know, the greedy ways that they are, they wanted more monetization nonsense being thrown in there, and they also wanted more installments. They were pushing for that Destiny 3, and obviously one of the big things that Activision took issue with was with sales with Destiny 2, which is ultimately why they just threw the franchise to the side and let Bungie do whatever they want with it for about $160 million, which is a lot, but the fact that Activision was willing to move on from Destiny was very, very surprising to just about everybody in the games industry. But anyway, to this story coming from PC Games N, which is actually just further detail from an interview coming from the YouTuber Hidden Xperia, I will have a link in the description to the two-hour interview that came on the YouTuber's channel. Very interesting hearing Marty O'Donnell's perspective, but as PC Games N points out, he is a Bungie veteran and the composer and sound designer for games including Myth and Halo, and he says he was let go from the studio in 2014 after fighting back against Activision to maintain control of Destiny. Marty also served as an executive at Bungie for a period of time, and he actually did have a lawsuit against Bungie, and he settled with the company and won the lawsuit for unpaid wages. But yeah, Marty, uh, he's very infamous in this industry. A lot of what we've heard from the Halo franchise, the sounds, is this guy. He's a legend. But anyway, this is what the interview goes over. O'Donnell accepts responsibility for his role in signing the deal with Activision initially, because I was in leadership and I was on the board of directors when we went with Activision. If there's any any blame for going to Activision, I'm part of it. We knew it was a risk right from the get-go, and then it turned out to be exactly as bad as we thought it was going to be. Going from Microsoft and Activision, yeah, ugh. I think everybody kind of knew that that was just a bad idea from the get-go. But O'Donnell continues, he says that, The official Bungie position on the split up with Activision has been mostly BS and scripted. Which, that's not too surprising, as I mentioned before, they're trying to save some face, and they want to maintain good relationship, and of course, them coming out against Activision, that's just a bad look. And this is an independent company that relies on publishers, and these deals to, I mean, survive right now. That's just how it is. But O'Donnell continues, he says, The reason why we went with Activision was not just the money, but it was because, as part of the contract, they, Activision, did not own the IP. Now remember, Microsoft owns the Halo IP, and we wanted to make sure whoever we were going to work with next would not own the IP. We would own the IP. That was a non-negotiable for me personally. And he points out that Activision agreed to this clause, and O'Donnell says that unlike any of the other big players, including Microsoft, that Bungie had approached at the time, which is ultimately why they went with Activision, and remember, Activision has a lot of money and a lot of funding that is attractive, but the problem is Activision's gritty little hands getting involved in trying to change things and that's what O'Donnell's gonna get into. He says, here's the spicy part. Activision not only didn't have the legal right to mess with the IP, but the only way they would be prevented from messing with the IP is if all the leadership at Bungie said, you can't mess with the IP, and that's not what happened, and that's why they fired me. In other words, in O'Donnell's telling, members of Bungie's board of directors were willing to give Activision at least some control over Destiny, while O'Donnell remained firm against allowing the publisher into creative decisions, and so the rest of the board voted to oust him from his position in the company. O'Donnell's account contradicts early statements from Bungie, which told Eurogamer last year that splitting from Activision had not changed much about the way Destiny is made on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to dispel the notion that Activision was some prohibitive overlord that wasn't letting us to do awesome things. Just gonna say right now, with how great that Destiny has, I mean, they've been able to turn it around drastically. Yeah, Activision was definitely a problem. And that specific statement was coming from Bungie's communications director at Gamescom in 2019. In terms of decision making, our creative leads are still calling the shots like they always were on what they want the game to be. Officially, Bungie has maintained that both its working relationship and eventual breakup with Activision were nothing but amicable. And we know that's not true based on some of the actual things going on inside of Blizzard. Like we have this tweet that came from Jason Schreier all the way back in 2019 when that official split was announced. He pointed out at the time, at today's meeting announcing the news that they're splitting from Activision, Bungie G staff cheered loudly. Can't overempathize how happy they are not to just get away from Activision, but to have a game that they now own completely. Imagine a Destiny free from Activision's restrictive, annualized schedule. And I will say that here in the future, Destiny's in a good place. And also remember that for a fact, we know that things 
were not 100% going well under Activision. It wasn't like there was just this huge shocking announcement because there was definitely some clear signs that these companies were at odds. This specific statement came from Luke Smith after an investor call in which Activision heads at the time were saying that they were concerned about Destiny. They said the game had underperformed Destiny 2 specifically and they were looking at more monetization opportunities and Luke Smith, the creative uh, director on the game, he said we are not disappointed with Forsaken, which is disputes what Activision was telling investors. We set out to build a game that Destiny players would love and at Bungie we love it too. Building Destiny for players who love it is and will remain our focus going forward. That statement would be made in November 2018, and just about two months later, Activision and Bungie would split. And I will say that it's very nice that Marty O'Donnell is kind of giving some truth to what we all kind of already knew, and it was that Activision and Bungie, things were not going well, and Activision's little nasty little hands were ruining Destiny. And a couple of years later, I can say that Destiny's in a good place, and a lot of players are excited about the future of this franchise, and Bungie has total freedom for with whatever they want to do, which is great, because they're not having to be forced to make a Destiny 3, and who knows what this franchise would look like if it was still under Activision. I would say that it would be a far worse in my personal opinion, but yes, Marty O'Donnell giving some further details about this relationship is definitely great, and I'm guessing in the years to come we're going to hear more executives pointing out that yeah, Activision was a major problem. Anyway, we discussed a lot of different gaming news today, like this Activision Blizzard story, and also Bethesda thanking Bioware for Anthem's failure. I guess that's that's technically what they were saying, but let me know your thoughts on everything that we discussed down in the comment section below. But thank you for watching, make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this video or found any informative value, and make sure to follow my other social media accounts for updates on new videos. Links are always down in the description below. I'm most active on Twitter giving opinions on news that I do not always get into video form, so do make sure to follow me over there. Also check out my Discord for all sorts of discussion on games. And again, thank you for joining, consider subscribing for more videos like this, and I'll see you later.